Hello, my name is Stephen Robertson. I've written a book, short title, BC Before Computers. Um, it's not a very long book, but it had a long gestation, uh, absurdly long. I'd like to tell you a little bit about my career and how I got interested in the themes of the book. My first degree was in mathematics. Um, I was always quite good at maths. Some of my contemporaries as mathematicians went into the then nascent field of computer science. Um, but I went in a slightly different direction. I took a master's course in information science, which had more in common with librarianship. I got particularly interested in information retrieval. In the modern world, think search systems such as Google. I made a career of research in information retrieval. A few years after my master's course, I got a, was very lucky to get a, a, a good research fellowship at University College London. I completed my PhD. During the course of that fellowship, I wrote a paper with uh, colleague from Cambridge, the late great Karen Spark Jones, um, published in 1976. It was um, about a method of ranking search results. It wasn't the first paper on ranking, um, but it was it laid out a, a, a good method for, for doing so. Uh, for ranking search results, again, in the modern world, think of Google. Through the most of the 80s and 90s, I worked at City University in London, where I had done my master's course, um, teaching and researching. The research was mainly into experiments and theoretical investigations of information retrieval by computer. In the early 90s, I invented a ranking algorithm, which is known as BM25. Um, that's is also quite well known. It's become, it was very successful in some ex competitive experiments in the 90s. And it's become one of the staples of information retrieval research to this day. Um, about the same time that I was working on that, people were beginning to design search systems for the web, search engines. Um, Google came along a few years later. About the time that Google started, I moved from City to a Microsoft Research Laboratory in in Cambridge. More about that in, in a minute. Go back to the 80s for a minute. A colleague and I at City started a new master's course called Information Systems and Technology. Um, it was aimed at least partly at people working in some specific domain who wanted to prepare for the coming encroachment of digital, digital systems and computers. I thought that such people should know something about information technology more broadly outside the digital framework and earlier than that. So I began to develop a small number of lectures on historical aspects of information technology. Later, when I moved to Microsoft Research, I was surrounded by mainly much younger people who'd been trained as computer scientists um, and often did not have any idea that any of the things that they were doing or thinking about had anything, any prior existence um, before computers came along. And I thought their horizons should be broadened as well. I'd like to give three examples of some of the things, the themes of the book, things that I thought that people ought to be aware of. The first example is the library. Libraries have been around for three millennia or so. They are a form of information te technology, in my view. Um, they're a way of providing access to the knowledge and information held in a collection of books 
providing access for many people over time. We know quite a lot about a library that, that was built in uh, Nineveh uh, in the 7th century BC um, by the ruler Asurbanipal. We know quite a lot about it because when Nineveh was sacked in about 600, the palace and the library were burnt to the ground. And that action turned out to be an extraordinary act of cultural preservation because the technology of the time, the book technology, was clay tablets. So books were written on clay tablets. Thousands of these clay tablets were baked hard in the fire and then buried in rubble for two and a half millennia. You can see them in the British Museum today. The lineage from the libraries of the time of Nineveh through to the World Wide Web and Google is continuous and direct. My second example comes from a very different domain. Pe people writing computer games today are often concerned with having models of th three-dimensional fantasy worlds in their computers, which are then projected onto screens for the player to see. One of the things that's commonly used by these designers of these games is the rules of perspective for, for the projection. We're familiar with that one of the reasons they use these rules is that we are very familiar with images produced according to the rules of perspective. We've been familiar with them for several centuries. The rules of perspective were invented in 15th century Italy in the Renaissance, and many artists use them, have used them. When photography came along in the 19th century, again, we, we could interpret the images easily because we knew about images produced according to those rules. Photography essentially uses the same rules. My third example is colour. Many people know that, according to physicists, colour sits on a spectrum, um, as you see in the rainbow, from red to violet, uh, which you can also reproduce with a crystal prism. Many people also know that many colours, perhaps all colours, can be produced by mixing a small number of primary colours, probably three. What is not so well known is that this colour mixing theory, three colour theory, um, has nothing to do with the spectrum of physics. It has to do primarily with the physiology of our eyes. On our retinas, we have two types, two main types of photosensitive cell, rods and cones, and the cones are further divided into three types uh, for primary colours, red, green and blue. And it's because of that that we can create the effect of one colour by mixing other colours. We had to learn about this three colour theory, which we did from the late 18th century, 19th century, um, and tr tried, then tried out in colour photography with more or less success um, before we could apply it to screens and, and uh, digital gadgets. Underlying all these ideas, a theme throughout the book, is the idea of data. We are very happy nowadays with thinking of text, numbers, images, moving images, sound, music, all as data, which can be processed in interesting ways by our digital devices. We are aware that corporations hold data about us 
from which they can infer many things by processing it in suitable ways. The idea of processing data, of data processing as an as a approach to things, emerged in a very specific context in the early 20th century before computers came along. Nowadays, in the 21st century, we think of everything as data. It seems to be ubiquitous. Those are some of the themes of my book. Thank you.